All right. Well, good morning and welcome. We're so glad that you're joining with us today. We have two services on Sunday morning. The first is devoted to Bible prophecy, and this, our second service, is our verse-by-verse teaching through the Word of God. We're currently in our trek through the Bible in 2 Timothy, and our text today is going to be chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. I want to invite you at this time to turn there if you're not there already. And while you're doing that, I want to mention just a couple of things, the first of which is doubtless you've heard about what's happening with social media platforms. And actually, this is why a few months ago we sensed from the Lord that we were to launch a new prophecy website, sort of in anticipation of what we sensed was coming. So that website is at jdfarag.org, and it will become the go-to place for everything Uh, should something happen. So if you haven't already checked it out, you might want to do that. Uh, You don't have to subscribe, but if you do, we will be sending out notifications. You've not gotten notifications yet. And the reason you've not gotten notifications yet is because we haven't sent out any notifications yet. (laughs) So we appreciate your patience with us in that regard. So uh, one more thing, I just wanted to mention, uh, and I mentioned this first service, and this is not hyperbole, and I don't blame people for uh, seeing it as such, but I am the most blessed and loved pastor on the planet. That's not hyperbole. No, I really mean that. So, no, for real. (laughs) Again, I, I know that might sound like hyperbole, but it's actually true. (laughs) I actually am. Um, I was uh, saying to first service that in a sanctified way, you guys spoil me. No, you really do, and my family too, and just so overwhelmed with your generosity, many of you who gave, and just such a blessing. And I'm actually wearing one of those blessings today. You like my shirt? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my color, uh, you know. I'm a winter, or whatever they call it. So anyway, I, no, but seriously, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, used to be before <laughs> everything happened that whenever I would share that, I would always comment about how that not many pastors can really say that. And now more so than ever, that is true. Uh, one last thing. I've already started with the last things. See what happens when you take a couple of weeks off. Um, you know, I was uh, thinking about this. I, I'm driving to church today, and I noticed something that I hadn't noticed uh, recently. But on the way to church, we live in Kailua, I usually see all of the signs for the church services for the other churches. And today, conspicuously absent on my drive to this church were any signs. And it just hit me, that's because they're not having church, because they're meeting in places, renting places that they can't meet and assemble together in. And it just hit me, and I, I found myself just thanking God for how blessed we are as a church. This is such an amazing church. And I'll say it again, I hope you don't tire of me saying it, but you make the pastorate a joy, such a joy. And it is such a profound privilege to be the pastor of this God's church. Okay, one last thing. (laughs) I've often said that if I wasn't the pastor of this church, this is where I would go to church. (laughs) It's such a loving church. You guys are the real deal, and I just love you so much. All right. Second Timothy chapter 3, our text again, verses 6 through 9. If you don't mind, I want to begin reading in verse 1 for the sake of context. And also it's been a couple weeks since we were in Second Timothy. So those of you that are here, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read. If not, where you're seated is fine. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, really warning Timothy, knowing that his days are numbered. It's just a matter of time. He's now come to the end of his life. 
He's finished the race. He's fought the good fight of faith. And these are his parting words to Timothy, who he sees as his son in the faith and loves him so much. So he's warning him. And he says, verse 1, by the Holy Spirit. But mark this, there will be terrible times, perilous times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, always posting on social media. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not... No, but that's a pretty apt description, isn't it? I'm sorry. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. They, verse 6, are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as verse 8, Janus in Jabris opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds, corrupt minds, who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But, verse 9, they will not get very far, because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. (laughs) Can't wait. Let's pray. If you would, please join with me. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for this portion that we have here before us today in your word. Lord, we need at this time the Holy Spirit to get our attention, hold our attention as you speak into our lives. We don't want any distraction. We don't want anything to get our minds to wander, so we miss what it is that you desire to minister to us today, especially in this portion of Scripture that we have. It is so apropos. Your Word is alive and active, and Lord, we're so thankful for it. And we ask you to bless our time together in it. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So, I want to talk with you today about the dangers those with evil motives and corrupt minds pose in the life of a Christian, and certainly in the life of a church. And again, it's so important to understand that these are Paul's final words to Timothy. I mean, he knows that it's just a matter of time. And it's not much longer. And think of it from Timothy's standpoint. He's had the Apostle Paul in his life, most of his life, arguably all of his life. And he too knows that it's not going to be long before his mentor, the Apostle Paul, is gone, and he won't have him anymore. And so Paul, as any father who loves his son, is warning him, steadying him, readying him for that which he knows is going to happen. This morning I was thinking about Acts chapter 20. It's pretty intense, where the Apostle Paul talks about how that to the Ephesians, I know what's going to happen when I'm gone. (laughs) They're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. And from among you, In other words, they're already in the church. 
you can just imagine about that time everybody's looking at the person sitting next to them. Don't do that, by the way, just, you know. From among you are going to rise up, and they're not going to spare the flock. And he says this, he says, I think it's about verse 23, Acts 20. He says, you guys, I, you know that I've been warning you and weeping every day, every night, day and night for three years, because I know that after I'm gone, they're going to come in and they're going to seek to destroy the work, the church, you, your faith. You know when Jesus, describing the enemy, says that He comes to steal, kill, and destroy? Have you ever thought of it this way? He steals your hope, He kills your joy, and He destroys your faith. Hope, joy, I mean, He's not going to steal your car. He doesn't need your car. (laughs) I know that's a silly way to illustrate it, but you get the point, right? steal your hope, kill your joy, and destroy, shipwreck your faith. And so that's the heart of the Apostle Paul here with Timothy, who he loves and sees as a son. Timothy, I I don't have much longer. Please take heed to this. Be ready, (laughs) be steady, because I know what's going to happen after I'm gone. And you have to understand too, and we know this about Timothy, he's kind of the shy personality, easily intimidated, dare I say manipulated, the timid type, bashful. And that's why Paul says, don't be timid. God's not giving you a spirit of timidity to be intimidated or fearful of man, intimidated by man, but power and love, and better translated, a disciplined mind. You know, we discipline our children, we need to discipline our mind. That's what he's saying there. So I wanted to frame this in this way, because when you understand the heart of the Apostle Paul towards Timothy, then you're able to see the heart in this warning to Timothy. So in preparing for this teaching, I was struck by something, that this warning would rise to the level of God deeming it necessary to inspire and include in the pages of Scripture. Think about this. I mean, there are so many things that I'm sure Paul, as we see in his letters to Timothy, wants to warn Timothy about. And yet he's warning Timothy about this in particular. I think it would stand to reason that this was of paramount importance to Paul. These men who had depraved minds, evil motives, that would prey on the vulnerable and the weak. So what I want to do is share with you what I see in our text today as four ways to first identify, spot, and second, be on guard against those who have been fully given over to depravity and corruption. The first one, verse 6, they trap and control the weak and the vulnerable. Here Paul tells Timothy that you can identify them, you can spot them, because they're going to prey on and seek to have control over those who are gullible. He, he, he says women, women don't take this personally, it's not just you, but anyone 
who's just gullible, vulnerable, weak. I would suggest that they're actually drawn to such people. By way of an illustration like magnet to a steel, uh, to steel, I hate to say it this way, but for lack of a better way of saying it, they can smell it. They can, they can smell vulnerability and gullibility a mile away, which is why they prey on them in the first place. You know what's sad? Many a Christian is naive and will believe anything or anyone who worms their way in, in this way. Oh, I mean, they're so unsuspecting. In fact, one of the red flags is that they're just so enveloping. There's something about their their personality. Hey, watch out. They have an agenda. Their intentions are malicious and nefarious. And they have spotted you as their victim. And the question is, do you spot them as the perpetrator? This is how you can. This is how you can. They seek to, and this again is in Acts 20. I would really encourage you to spend some time in Acts 20. Paul talks about how that you can spot these guys because they're always recruiting and drawing disciples unto themselves, not Jesus. It's manipulative. They prey on and they want to have control over. And when they see that you're vulnerable, then they draw you unto themselves, disciples after themselves. And then they wield that control in your life. These are men with corrupt minds and evil motives. And we would do well to have discernment to know them when we see them. Second one, verse 2, or uh, pardon me, verse 7. This is interesting. Paul says they're always learning, but have no knowledge of the truth. Now, there's some discussion about whether or not this is referring to the perpetrator, the one with the corrupt and depraved mind, or is it talking about the victim, the vulnerable and gullible victim? I would suggest that it's not really necessarily an either or proposition, but perhaps both. And I'll explain why I say that. On the side of the perpetrator, yes, they always come off this way. They always come in this way like they really know what they're talking about. That's part of the the whole plan, if I can say it like that. And on the part of the the victim, I hate to use that word, it's been hijacked. Sorry to use hijacked, I shouldn't use that word either. But (laughs) uh, the victims of these perpetrators, this can apply too as well. Because they don't have the knowledge of the truth, which is what makes them vulnerable to begin with. Hang in there with me. This is actually where I'm going with this one. So let's get back to the perpetrator. They lace the truth with just enough deception, so it sounds right. Kind of like what the serpent did to Eve in the garden. You know, Satan can quote Scripture better than you, right? You know that right? He knows Scripture better than you and I do. So what he does is he, he quotes it ever so subtly. <laughs> Sorry for the effects, but you get the point, right? So it sounds right. I think of Eve, because God never said, don't touch it. The serpent did. Half God said, 
And here's Eve. God said, we're not supposed to eat from this tree, nor are we supposed to touch it. Wait a minute. That's not what God's, God's Word said. And you've just fell prey to the deceit of the enemy who has laced just enough deception in with the truth to make it sound right. And so you believe it. Here's where I'm going. And if you were to ask me what I thought was one of the biggest problems for Christians today, if not the biggest problem for Christians today, it would have to be biblical illiteracy. Let me say the same thing in a different way. We are sitting ducks if we don't know God's Word. You have to understand that Satan, who does know God's Word, and also knows that you do not know God's Word, he knows exactly what to do. And the description we have of him stalking his prey like a lion, very patiently waiting for the optimum time to attack. Oh, they're discouraged. They're alone. They're isolated. They're down. They're tired. They're disappointed. I mean, I can go on with the list. I don't have to, right? Now's the time. And he pounces. And he's got you. And then I think of the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. We, we talk about it all the time. Well-known passage, the spiritual armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth that holds everything together, by the way, the shoes of peace, the sword of uh, the Spirit, and the shield of faith. And after you put on, metaphorically, this spiritual armor, what does Paul say? Now, stand. Stand. Firm. So here comes the enemy. Oh, how you doing? <laughs> I see you're a little bit discouraged today. Yeah. Didn't turn out as you hoped it would. Yeah. Hmm. Hath God said? Now here you are. I don't know. You know what just happened? He has planted a seed of doubt in a biblically illiterate mind that can't discern. Wait a minute, stop. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> nice try. Get out of my face. God didn't say that. I know what you're doing. I'm on to you. Nice try. I know again, that's a, but, but think of it this way. And here's the takeaway. It is so important to be solid in the Word of God and the God of the Word. You're immovable. You stand firm. He can't do that to you. He can't get away with that. And not only that, but instead of attracting Him, you repel Him. Here's how I see it. And I know they have clinical terms for this condition. This is the way I think. I picture it like this. The enemy is roaming to and fro, going, you know, searching for, looking for whom and when he can devour a Christian. And so he comes to my address. He goes, oh, no, just, not don't, don't, don't bother. Don't bother. He's not going to go for it. Hey, we used to get him, you know, back in the day. Not anymore. Not now. Move on. Go to the next address. Whoa, look at this guy. <laughs> yeah, let's get him. Let's get her. You know, it's a low-hanging fruit, as they say it, for a pastor to harp on this, you know. 
But I got to tell you, I don't know. I'll just speak for myself. I don't know how I would be able to survive, let alone thrive, especially in this day that we're living in, if it weren't for being grounded in the Word of God. I'm telling you. And I don't know moving forward in the days ahead how it's possible. It, please know that it's not like God saying, you need to spend more time in the Bible and in prayer. Call yourself a Christian. No, it's not like that at all. In fact, it's the opposite of that. It's more like this. Here's our loving Heavenly Father, like a loving Apostle Paul to a Timothy. I love you so much. You're not going to make it unless you stand on the Word. You're grounded in the Word. You know the Word. So that when, not if, the enemy comes, you can say, out with you. Get out. What are you even bothering for? You got the wrong address. You pulled the wrong file. It's a loving Heavenly Father saying, I I can't stand it when I see someone I love so much fall prey, needlessly, unnecessarily. This need not be so. Stand firm in the Word. You get into the Word, the Word gets into you. You're bulletproof. You're bulletproof. And by the way, don't you find it interesting, getting back to the armor, that the only offensive weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? Oh, yeah. You know, in my time with the Lord this last couple of weeks, I spent some time in 1 Samuel 17, one of my favorite places in the Scripture, of course, with all the other places in the Scripture. But it's the account of when David slays the uncircumcised Philistine that defied the armies of the living God. I love that story. I, man, I, can, I can't wait to meet David. I just, what was, what was that like when he started talking smack? You know, when you went out and he's like looking at you going, is this a joke? Is it, where's the cameras? Am I being punked? What's going on here? What are you doing? Go back home. What was that like? I, I, would just, I would have loved to have been a fly on a camel or a whatever that was there at the time to see how this thing went down. But it's really interesting. There's a detail that I, I've seen it, I've read it, I've taught it so many times, but it just jumped off the page at me. And it says that David did not have a sword in his hand. So you know what he does? He goes and gets himself one. Oh, how convenient. Goliath has one. We're even told how big it was. I would venture to say when David picked it up, it's kind of like, you know, this thing is huge. He picked up the enemy's sword and took his head off. Oh, the sword, the sword of the Spirit. The word of the word of God, I mean, you know, just just that off with your head, out with you. Isn't that what Jesus did when he was tempted? Oh, you know, Jesus had been fasting for forty days and forty nights. Make no mistake about it, he was physically spent, exhausted, weak, vulnerable. That's when the enemy comes. And it's kind of interesting. I think it's recorded in Luke's gospel after he failed, we're told another very interesting detail in the narrative that Satan left, but would come back at a more optimum time. In other words, that's not the only time Satan tried to tempt Jesus. It's just the one we have recorded. But he was going to wait for another optimum time. In other words, that was the optimum time when Jesus was almost starved to death. Weak. Here comes the enemy. How does Jesus defeat him, stand against him? The Word of God. The 
Word of God. It is written. It is written. It is written. And he flees. Resist the devil, and he will flee. How? The Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. Out with you. The truth of God's Word. The third one, I want to get ahead of myself. I want to spend a little bit of time on these last two. It's in verse 8. They reject, oppose, and counterfeit the truth. This is interesting because Paul is referencing the account in Exodus chapter 7, when Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh, and they say, let my people go. And of course we know how (laughs) that ended, not well for Pharaoh. But in chapter 7 we're introduced to these two sorcerers. I use that word specifically because of the prophecy update today. Sorcerers, magicians. These were demon-possessed magicians in the satanic magical arts. And even in Exodus chapter 7, we're not told their names, but Paul, for some reason, somehow, knows who they were and what their names were. Janus and Jabras. Now why, pray tell, would Paul bring them up and into this discussion in warning Timothy? I believe it's because of the subtlety of the counterfeit. Please know that Satan is the master counterfeiter. Satan can counterfeit supernatural signs and wonders. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're told that the Antichrist will perform these miracles in the realm of the supernatural, and Paul refers to them as lying signs and wonders. They're counterfeit. So what's Paul's point? I mean, one has to ask, why would he bring these two men up that opposed and rejected and counterfeited the miracles? I believe it's because that's how you can spot a counterfeiter. Stay with me. The counterfeit validates and authenticates the genuine. You know, it's kind of interesting because these two guys, when the Nile River is turned to blood, they do the same thing, counterfeit. Here's a question. Why don't you turn it back to water? Well, you can't do that. Why can't you? Because it's a counterfeit. Satan cannot create. He can only counterfeit. And when he counterfeits, it authenticates and validates the genuine, the authentic. That's why you don't see a counterfeit $70 bill, because there's no such thing as a genuine $70 bill. That's why you find counterfeit $100 bills. The counterfeit authenticates the genuine. You know, back in the day, when you say back in the day anymore, it's kind of like, how long ago? Yeah, it wasn't that long ago, but they actually, you know, back when they actually still accepted cash. I don't know if you're anything like me, but it's kind of like you pull cash out and they're like, get thee behind me, Satan. We don't accept that anymore because we want to go to a digital cashless Mark B system. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I had a prophecy update flashback. I'm, I'm back now. But no, that's true, right? You go to the bank, Ask them, ask them for, you know, $100 bills. Well, I'm so sorry, sir, we have a shortage of... No, you don't. Don't tell them like, like that. <laughs> now, can I share Jesus with you? It doesn't work. But, uh, you know, again, that's the, another topic for another time. But back in the day, I was actually going to make a profound point here. <laughs> back in the day, they would teach the bank teller to spot counterfeit currency by getting them so familiar with the genuine, counting it, feeling it, touching it, smelling it, getting familiar with it. 
And when they were so familiar with the genuine, they would slip in a counterfeit. And that teller would like, "Uh uh-uh. Something doesn't smell quite right with that. Something doesn't quite feel right with that. One of the things I'm learning in my walk with the Lord is never, never, never go against that check that God puts in your spirit. That is His protection to protect you. The counterfeit. I want to read Exodus 7 verses 10 through 12. You'll see why here in a moment. This is the account of this Janus and Jambres who opposed Moses and counterfeited these miracles. We're told, verse 10, so Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. (laughs) How cool is that? But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, So the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. What's up with that? What's the big deal? We can do that. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. (laughs) I love it when God does that. That's what God does. Oh, you you can counterfeit it. Watch this. Can't counterfeit that. What's the takeaway? Oh, God will always have the final word. When it comes to evil, when it comes to the enemy, when it comes to counterfeits, you can be assured without exception, without question, that the rod of God will swallow up the counterfeit of the enemy. This last one we'll spend the remainder of our time on in verse 9, and it's that they will be exposed publicly for who they really are. I love verse 9. I thank God for verse 9 in this chapter here in 2 Timothy. This is what I absolutely love about God's Word. It's not that God does it. That's a given, okay? It's the way God does it. Think about Ezekiel 38, a prophecy we talk about often where we're told that there will be this alliance of nations that will invade Israel. The battle of Gog, Magog that we refer to it as. And so you've got Russia, Iran, Turkey, and this alliance of nations that's going to invade Israel. And it's going to be a devastating and, I mean, decisive and swift defeat of this invading army. And it's almost like God is kind of showing off a little bit. It's kind of like, look at, all, look at those armies. I know, do you see how big they are? You see how many they are? You see how powerful they are? And we're just little old Israel. I know. Cool, huh? No, not cool. Watch me now. This is a setup. Watch what I'm going to do, and take note of why I'm going to do it. Not only am I going to defeat them decisively, swiftly, But the reason I'm going to do it, why I'm going to do it, is so that they will all know who I am. I am God. I am the Lord. And there will be no doubt. It will be very clear in no uncertain terms. That's why. And I'm going to do it. I think about the Red Sea. Oh, I love the Red Sea. That's another one, right? Can you, you know, it's, it's, easily missed when you're reading the, the account of it. But could you imagine being there? I mean, you just witnessed 10 over-the-top supernatural plagues come down on Egypt. You've been untouched. 
and miraculously, not only do you leave Egypt, you take their gold. Of course, Aaron's going to use it to build a calf later, but we'll, you know, (laughs) we'll not worry about that right now. So here you are, you've just witnessed all of this. And you come to this obstacle, well, quite, quite an obstacle actually. <laughs> it's called the Red Sea. And, and here's another problem, by the way, if you think this wasn't bad enough, um, the Egyptians are hot on your tail. What are you going to do? I don't know. I mean, this doesn't not, not look good. This will not end well. We're either going to get killed by the Egyptians or we're going to drown in the Red Sea. Just take your pick. This is how it ends. Thanks for the memories. <laughs> Can you imagine? And then they're like, all ready to Moses. We don't know how long it was. I wouldn't, uh, I, I can't believe it was that long after the Exodus. It had to be maybe days after witnessing all these miracles, and they come to the Red Sea, and what do they do? They start complaining. This is just the beginning of 40 years of this stuff. And and their complaint is, were there not enough graves in Egypt? God had to bring us out here to kill us? Really? That's what you think? Poor Moses, he's gone, what have I gotten myself into? And so he cries out to the Lord, the Egyptians are there, the Red Sea's here, the Israelites are surrounding him. And the Lord says, I want you to take your rod. <laughs> you know the one that you turned into a serpent? Yeah, that one. And I want you to hold it out and behold the salvation of the Lord. And when we're told that the Red Sea parted, and that the Israelites walked on dry ground. That means the water parted, and the Israelites walked on dry ground. Now you're there. You're like, oh my goodness. I think this is the way we're supposed to go, don't you? (laughs) Thank you, God. Wow. That is so cool. And then here's the thing, you you cross over on dry ground. And then the Egyptians are in pursuit. And God just waits. And then He unparts the Red Sea and kills the Egyptians. You know, there are those who say, well, you know, it's kind of interesting because that wasn't actually a miracle. At that time of the year, there's usually these high winds, and you can get, you know, the, the water parted, and you know, the, the water is actually shallow. The red, the, not the Red Sea, the Reed Sea. It's a very shallow place. You're like, really? Well, that's even a bigger miracle. Because how does God then drown all the Egyptians in shallow water? <laughs> nice try. I know God's Word. <laughs> you can't do that. I, it says dry ground. Dry ground. It says Red Sea. You're spelling it wrong. Red Sea. One E. Again, this is what happens when I take a couple weeks off. <laughs> Let me try to bring it back even when it looks like evil is going to win. And doesn't it look like today that evil is going to prevail? I mean, you don't have to look too far. The evil minds, the demon possessed satanic evil. It looks like if, if you just look at it through the lens of the natural, it's like, again, this is how it ends. You're at the Red Sea, Egyptians behind with the vaccine, and this is how it ends. I keep going back to the prophecy update. I'm so sorry about that, but again, I'm going somewhere. Just bear with me. But God, 
Oh, you, oh, wait a minute. You, come on, JD. I'll just use myself as the poster child here. Do you actually think I was going to let you drown in the Red Sea? You think I was going to let you be defeated and killed by the Egyptians? Come on, you think Goli- You think I'm going to let Goliath, you know, take your head off with his sword? Then I'm going to put in your hand to take his head off? Come on, what's the matter with you? Oh, you, th- you think evil is going to prevail? Watch me now. Watch me now. Replete throughout Scripture, we find accounts of how it looked as though, this is it, evil won, evil prospered, evil prevailed. And God says, is that really what you think? Hmm. One of my favorite examples of this is Psalm 73. Man, for those of you that were with us in our study through the book of Psalms, what a, what a rich, rich, rich study in God's Word. I think we were in Psalms for a year and a half, two years. <laughs> we were in no hurry to finish the book of Psalms. But when we got to Psalm 73, we hit a very interesting Psalm because it has to do with a guy by the name of Asaph who wrote the psalm that had come to his wit's end. I mean, not only is this guy having a crisis of faith, but I mean, this is it. It's like, it's over. It's game over. I'm looking around and all I see is evil prevailing and it's messing me up. And I'm having such a crisis of faith right now. And I cannot see how the goodness of God in this, I cannot see how God is going to have the final word in this. And it's so bad that I won't even talk to a brother or sister in Christ, because if I do, I'll stumble them, because I'll pick up on it. Because I've got some questions about why it is that God is allowing evil to prevail. Listen to verses 2 and 3, Psalm 73. He says, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In other words, here I am. I'm walking with the Lord, pleasing to the Lord and my neighbor who blasphemes God, pulls up in a brand new Mercedes Benz. Oh, we're trying to comfort ourselves. I can't imagine the payments on that. No, they paid cash. They did. What? They blaspheme God. And here I am. I I pull in, talk about back in the day, in my Yugo. Remember those? <laughs> pull in, that I have payments on. And I pull into the driveway and I'm like, what's up with this, God? This ain't right. They're wicked. I'm righteous in you. <laughs> Surely I'm walking in righteousness in vain. And that's what he says in verse 13. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and wash my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued, chastised every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. I I couldn't even talk to people because they would have picked up on it and know that I'm having a crisis of faith and it would mess them up. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. I couldn't even bear it. Just the thought of it until, verse 17, just like I love verse 9 in 2 Timothy 3, I love verse 17 in Psalm 73. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Just wait. Oh, I know what it looks like now. Doesn't look good for the home team. (laughs) Just wait. And oh, by the way, 
Uh, another one of those details I think we would do well to take note of. It was when he went into the sanctuary of God, the presence of the Lord. That's a good place to start. Because when you do, then God, now that He's got you and your undivided attention, He's going to show you some things. And you know what He's going to show you? He's going to show you how it ends for them. And you go from being envious of them, angry at them, to feeling sorry for them. No, because that's what the psalmist says. He says, I went into the sanctuary of the Lord, the presence of God. He showed me how it's going to end for them. And I'm like, oh, do they know this? Somebody better tell them. This is how it ends for them. Oh, I'm not angry at them anymore. I surely don't envy them anymore. I pity them. And isn't that an apt description? of our day today. You know, I've shared many times, I hope you don't tire of me sharing this, but God has been doing a deep work in my heart towards people. And I just cannot any longer, I have my moments where I get in the flesh. You always know you're in the flesh when you want a pound of flesh. That was pretty good, actually. That wasn't even my notes. You're in the flesh. You want a pound of flesh? You're in the flesh. You see that politician on TV? You're like, grrr. And the Lord's like, what are you doing that for? Well, did you hear what they said? Yeah, but I died for them. You don't see people as Democrat, Republican, right, left, conservative, liberal, globalist, nationalist. I mean, you can take that list as far down as you want. If you really think about it, they're either lost or they're saved. They're either damned or they're saved. When you see their end, that's the only thing that settles me and calms me when I look at that person and I say to myself, God, get them. I think about David in the Psalms when he prays for his enemies. Crack all their teeth in their mouth and let them choke on it. That's actually not a, that's not really what he was praying. He's basically saying, Lord, silence them. So don't be getting any ideas. God's not going to answer that prayer. But you're like, God, get them. It's like God's saying, I'm trying but not in the way you think. I'm trying to get them into heaven, because I love them. And they're not the enemy. The enemy's the enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood people. One last thing, and this will be the last thing, and I, just if you'll indulge me, I think I would be grossly remiss if I didn't just at least comment on what we just witnessed in this nation. The events that took place at the Capitol and now the ensuing inauguration. I mean, would you agree that this is satanic in the sense that the enemy wants to get people to destroy each other for him and instead of him, so he can take the week off. We're basically doing his dirty work. This is the whole plan. Our, our, our battle is not against man. Our battle is against four entities listed there again in Ephesians chapter 6, principalities, rankings of wickedness in high places. And what the enemy is doing and succeeding, dare I say, at doing it, he's riling up, working up, rising up people to destroy each other. Because, as Jesus said, It is impossible 
if the house is divided, it cannot stand. It's when it's divided. And is this not textbook, divide and conquer? Can you take what we just saw here in God's Word and apply that as a template and use your God-given discernment to see that? That's what this is all about. He seeks to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. But God, but God, when you see how it ends for them, it changes everything. It changes the way you see them. It changes the way you pray for them. <laughs> it changes everything. Why don't you stand? We'll pray. Thank you, Lord, so much. It's a good word today, Lord, hearing your word. It always is, of course, but so fitting, so apropos for where we're at. And of course, that's because your word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to cut and divide between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. Lord, I pray that your word and our time together today in your word will have the needed effect in our lives cutting out that which does not belong, removing that which could be very threatening and perilous in our lives, in our hearts. Perform that spiritual, supernatural surgery, if need be, as painful as it might be. Lord, we know that you love us, and you'll do everything and stop at nothing to protect us, in as much as you're able, and in as much as we cooperate and submit to you. So Lord, I pray that we'll take these things that we've looked at today and take heed to your word. In Jesus' name, Amen.